Today, we welcome Byron from Snakes for Africa. In this podcast, we cover a comprehensive range of topics related to snake husbandry, addressing not only the joys of snake ownership, but also the responsibilities that come with ensuring the well-being of these fascinating reptiles. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Welcome, Byron, to the Poison Fed podcast. Um, I'm delighted that you're here today. Um, I have a particular interest in snakes because I am a co-owner, as my son has a snake, um, but also as a vet we come across snakes and snake incidents all the time. So I'm excited to chat to you and just educate our listeners a little bit more about snakes and their husbandry and their involvement in our general daily lives. So welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. Um, straight off the bat, I've been keeping snakes myself for pretty much well my entire adult life and my, my life from about the age of nine or ten. So I go back to the old school from before the internet, before we had access to information. A lot of what I have in my head is self-learned. There were books available, but very little on husbandry and keeping of snakes. Identification snake books were there, but we learned pretty much as we went along. Now we've got access to information on the internet and other people that have kept snakes. Also bear in mind, when I started keeping snakes at the age of nine or 10, I was the only kid in the school that had any interest or knowledge in snakes. Then as I got older, one or two more, I think I finished high school with one or two mates that kept snakes. Now, when I do, when I address a school group that's got well, 60 or 70 kids, at least three or four of them have pet snakes. So pet snakes have become a much more prevalent thing. At one stage, it was said to be the fastest growing pet trend in the world. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, we've seen a definite shift towards people keeping snakes over the past, I would say, 10 to 15 years. Wow. So what, where did the interest appear? My, my personal interest started in Westville. We used to find the snakes in the garden all the time. We were terrified of them. We had a neighbor who wasn't, and he taught us, taught me slowly, step by step, which ones are venomous, which ones are not. Um, and even if they're venomous, you don't have to kill everything you see. Then I found a couple of them quite interesting and found that if you had a snake in a cage and you f could find frogs or lizards to feed it, it was quite cool. Um, so I was this little nine or 10 year old boy f catching frogs and lizards and feeding my snakes with this, I was fascinated. Um, for what that's worth now, it is now frowned upon quite seriously to put a snake and a lizard or a frog in the same cage. <laughs> so feeding of a captive snake is now done almost exclusively, not 100% exclusively, but with pre-killed frozen food like rats and mice and lizards and frogs all put in the snake's cage dead already. That's not how we did it when we were young. So you know, we come from a, a, a different background there to what the kids these days have. So I started keeping snakes I think it was a red-lipped herald, the first snake I kept as a kid and kept in a cage and fed it frogs and it laid eggs and the eggs hatched and it's exciting and these little tiny baby snakes and feeding them little tiny toads and it, so it was fascinating. That's where it started. Um, and then through high school, I kept and bred a few snakes, sold snakes to mates at school. They kept snakes, we learned. I remember the one situation, a, a mate of mine had a, a massive six-foot fish tank that had a cracked base. So it is no longer a fish tank, it now became a snake cage. He put a 150 watt spotlight in the one corner and he had house snakes and heralds and grass snakes and night adders and all sorts of things all in the same cage oh with the spotlight. And we had a hot day in February and everything was dead. Oh no. So we learned quite rapidly, yes, snakes mm. do like warmth. They don't survive with blazing no. heat. Um, and there we've learned, snakes like the heating pad. Then certain species need a heating pad. They have to have a heating pad. If they don't have it, they they don't thrive. Um, but they don't thrive with blazing hot temperatures. Weirdly enough, although snakes are cold-blooded and they prefer to be warm in order to thrive, they survive plummeting cold temperatures way better than they do extreme heat. Like for an example, I do call-outs as well, I go and catch snakes. If I take a snake from somebody's house, put it in a bag on my front seat in my car, and leave my car in the sun for 10 minutes, that snake will be dead. Same as a cat or a dog or a child. People think, but snakes love the heat. We see them out on the road. They love the heat. They cannot survive. If, for example, we get a cold snap like we did a few weeks ago here where we didn't have a, a maximum temperature of more than six degrees and the snake is caught outside, it'll be fine. Three or four days later, it warms up and it carries on fine. So they do, they do cope better with load shedding than you'd expect, some species. Um, 
they just, they just survive the cold better. They don't like the cold, they don't thrive when it's cold, but they survive the cold. Temperatures above 40, 45 degrees, they die quickly. Welcome back to Just For Pets, you're with Dr. Cara. Hi Doc, it's Justin the Jack Rossi here, and boy am I itchy. Are you on a hypoallergenic diet? Hyper what now? Changing to a special diet will really help, and Just For Pets have a massive range. And flea and tick medication, special shampoo. Oh, how quick can you get some? Order today and we'll deliver pronto. I feel better already. Justforpets.co.za Vet approved, pets adored. Get it all to your door. Let's get back to our conversation on the Pause and Effect podcast. So why do people like keeping them as pets? There's the fascination, obviously, little yeah, boy. <laughs> it is a fascination. So, in fact, just yesterday I had the exact same question. Somebody sort of horrified that somebody's <laughs> keeping snakes as pets. Said, you know, some people actually keep dogs as pets and dogs bite people. So I can joke about that. It's funny. But it's the same mindset, I think, as people that keep birds or fish. It's a combination. You can hold your snake. You can't hold the fish. Um, and then I say to the people, you can hold a snake and it's not going to bite you. You can hold your bird, but it's going to bite you. So you know, we can dig wherever we like. They're beautiful. They're fascinating. They're definitely not everybody's cup of tea. But then even people that keep dogs, some people will love Great Danes and won't like Bostons. And so within the snake keeping community, there's people that like the venomous ones and people that like the harmless ones. But we all keep them for some reason of enjoyment of the fascination of them. To sit and watch them moving around in the cage. To some people, the fascination is watching them eat their, their, their food, whatever it is. But it's a fascination. And sometimes it's just to be different from everybody else. So there's a variety of Just reasons. an interest. Yeah. Mm. And so set up. So I'm going to give the example because I did contact you when my son said he wanted a snake. And I said, what do I need to know? What do I need to do in order to set up an enclosure that is appropriate for a first time snake owner. So we did discuss this mm. and I think we went the route that I said. So a very simple basic cage, it's not particularly expensive and it is very simple and very basic. Um, a six sided cage with a glass sliding front is better than a fish tank with an opening top. There are a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, the temperature control is better in a wooden enclosure. Glass enclosure loses heat quite quickly and heats up incredibly quickly from outside. The other thing is snakes fill two roles in ecology. They're predators, yes, but they're also prey. And most of the predatory animals that eat snakes come from above. So cats, birds, whatever, they're going to attack the snake from above. So if he's in an open-sided glass cage, everything is potentially threatening. So he can see everything coming and he feels nervous all the time. Some species, some species couldn't care less. If you put them in a wooden cage with a glass sliding front, you're approaching the cage from the front all the time. And the snakes get used to that. They don't see you as a threat. They see you as, I don't know how intelligent they are, whether they see you as a food provider or as a companion, I don't know. But they tend to respond better when they're approached from their own level. Also, we mentioned the heat control. Most of the wooden cages, you can put a heating pad in or under the cage. A glass tank, if you put a heat pad in, tends to crack the base. Okay, so it's, not, it's old school. That's what I used to use when I was a kid. So the basic setup is a wooden cage, glass sliding front, a water bowl, um, that the snake has access to, easy access. Some species are terrestrial and they don't climb. Some species are boreal. You might need to then mist the cage so they can drink off the leaves. And then almost all species will need somewhere to hide. So you can combine the water bowl as a hiding place. You cut a hole in and it can hide underneath. Or they have a separate hiding place. What I like to do and I like to encourage is to have a variety of different hiding places in the cage. So if that place is too hot, it can move. If it's too cold, it can move. Um, then we also discuss a little bit, and it depends how involved you get with the discussion. If the snake can come into contact with the heating pad, it has the potential to burn itself. And people say, but how? I mean, it's, it surely can feel it's getting burnt. If you've never experienced sunburn, you'll never understand this, but you can lie in the sun in February and get sunburned that your skin falls off. The snakes are exactly the same. It's warm, it's comfortable, they sleep, and two or three days later, their entire belly comes off with scale burn, with, with burn. So a simple cage, if the snake does have access to the heating pad, should be covered with something cardboard or a tile or something that absorbs a little bit of the heat. There should preferably, preferably be a controller or a dimmer or a thermostat to control the heat. Some of these heating pads that the pet shops will sell can get up to 50 degrees. Okay? And if you shield that heat, it's fine. If you don't, it's not. And as I said, we learned that very young with a spotlight, that you can cook snakes very, very quickly. 
Um, if they don't have access to the heating pad, they will be in a permanent stage of not really wanting to eat. They only eat when it's warm. Okay, so if they don't have enough warmth, they're not going to eat. They will survive, I hate to even tell people this, incredibly long without food when it's cool. And when I say incredibly long, people think, geez, I can last six or seven hours without food. <laughs> snakes can last six or seven months wow. without food. So you think the snake's fine, it's not eating, it's okay. And then you get them after five or six months. Normally people worry after two or three attempts at feeding them, but sometimes five or six months later, the snake still hasn't eaten, and it's probably not going to recover because it's reached that point of no return because it's been too cold for too long and the body just Shuts gives down. up. And then sometimes, five, six, seven, eight months later, the snake will eat a meal like there is no problem and carry on and thrive and live a happy life. So it's variable. So the ideal temperatures are, for most subtropical species, somewhere between 27 and 33 degrees. They don't like to be below 23 degrees, and they can't survive above 40 degrees for very long. And substrate? Substrate varies as well. Um, most of the old school guys like me started on fish tank gravel, okay, and that's terrible. It absorbs all sorts of stuff. It's hard to keep Quite clean. Quite abrasive. It's abrasive, and all their feces and whatever it sinks to the bottom, and you don't see how dirty it is, and then you get, you get infection, what we used to call scale rot. Um, people still call scale rot. They get an infection. So gravel is not great. Sand or gravel is not great. Some species that are exclusive, like specialist species, have to be kept on sand, but that's a different story. So most of us use either pine shavings that you'd use for your hamster or your mouse, or simple newspaper or cotton roll. Then they use potting soil or mulch or a variety of things. If, you, if there's a smell, like a, like a pungent, like a eucalyptus smell, don't use it. If it's scented pine, don't use it but just simple, something that's easy for you to clean. The worst thing is, so snakes do lend themselves to, to lazy keepers, because A, you're not feeding them every day, <laughs> and B, they don't go to the toilet every day. Yeah. So you can literally go away for a weekend and not worry They're about getting house They're quite low maintenance pets. Very low maintenance. Yeah. So it encourages that. And then the day that they do defecate in their water bowl on the heat pad and you're away, yo. so you have to keep the water clean. Um, so like I said, you, you can go away for a weekend. Water, change I change it? all my water bowls at least once a week, at very least, okay? And some of them, because they evaporate quicker in a warm cage, they're topped up more often. And then as soon as somebody defecates in that water bowl, it's cleaned immediately. Because um, that, that's obviously, they're not, they may not drink it, and if they do drink it, it's certainly not a great it's idea. It's not pleasant. When I used, to, I used to work at the Durban Snake Park back in the late 90s, and we used to have a rule there that if you wouldn't want to drink out of that water bowl, yourself, don't leave it for the animal to drink out of. And I think that goes across the board for all pets, your cats, your dogs, your, your, your birds. If you wouldn't drink out of that water bowl, don't expect your animal to. They don't have a choice. They can't go to another tap and get fresh water. And how regularly would you be changing the, all the substrate? Okay, so if you have a, 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 the opportunity to spot clean, like it's on shavings or mulch, and you can clean out just that dirty area, as soon as you notice it, clean it out. If it's on paper, you take the whole paper out. What I do with mine, I spot clean as it occurs, and then I clean everything at least every two weeks. At least. So it's not, it's not like we have a two-week rotation where we do it on the second Sunday of every month. Sometimes a cage, you just think, okay, that needs cleaning, and then you do. Um, and sometimes when they defecate, you know you need to clean the entire cage. Another thing that people don't realize, with a confined space that they're kept in, because it's not like a cat or a dog that can roam around and choose somewhere, defecates in some part of the cage and sometimes you open that cage and that ammonia smell hits you straight in the face. That animal's breathing that in. So if that cage smells dirty or unclean, clean it straight away. I would say at least, to be fair, across the board, at least once a month, change and clean the entire cage. And what can but you use to clean? I mean, obviously I you're going to empty it, but are you allowed to spray it with a detergent? Um, I use F10 or Jig bleach. Um, don't ever mix Jick and Handy Andy, just by the way. Okay. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> Jick and Handy Andy will kill you Top and tip. your pets. <laughs> it, is, it is fatal. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize, and I, I'm often hesitant to mention it because if you didn't know, you wouldn't have thought of it, don't use Dettol or Savalon. Don't. You will kill your snake. Okay, so okay. F10 is a... Is F10 a... is absolutely perfect. Mild solution of Jick or Bleach is, is awesome. Handy Andy is fine on its own. Um, yeah, but that, that's basically it. F10 is my, my personal favorite. Okay. And in terms of ventilation? 
Different species have different requirements, and it sounds weird to say that everything needs air. There's never a time when there's, like the animal breathes too much, like he died because he breathed too much. But if a cage is drafty, certain animals, certain species won't thrive. If the cage is too dry, certain species won't thrive. So the most popular pet snake species is the ball python. Okay. They do quite well with very limited ventilation. So you think you get these nice through flow of air and you advance on either side and the back and the front, they don't do well. So you think you're doing the best thing and you've actually done the worst thing. So them, they prefer relatively, I wouldn't call it stagnant air, but they don't need the air movement that some of the other guys do. So I ventilate all my cages, I put vents on the sides of all of them, but there's always the facility to close the vents if you need to. And where, where you'll notice they need less ventilation or more ventilation, with the batting to shed their skins. So during, particularly now in winter time when the air is dry, you come in and you find your snake has shed little bits and pieces of skin and you, you spray it with water and it comes off or you moisturize it, it comes off. But if you just block up the air holes for a day, spray the cage, they will shed their skins fine. Okay, so your ventilation is, is vital, but it's not quite as important as for warm, oh, the, the difference is while being warm-blooded and cold-blooded, they don't respire like a cat or a dog or like we do. They do respire, but they don't build up body heat respiring like we do. Okay. And in terms of if they have pets, how often would you say, without causing them stress, unnecessary stress, particularly watching as a mother, watching my son handle that sick, I'm like, think it's time out. Like how, how frequently can you handle them? Is, is it ever too much? Um, mm. It is a tricky thing. And we see it especially with the youngsters, like, like your son, there's no, no blame laid anywhere. Because it's fascinating, you want to hold them all the time. And the snakes in nature are solitary animals. They don't seek out the company of anything or anybody, and they shy away from any contact in nature. In captivity, certain species tolerate contact, like the ball pythons, the corn snakes, Burmese pythons, some of the milk snakes and things, they tolerate it. But too much, they're going to, they're going to be in a state of stress where they're not sure when they're gonna be handled again. And the problem with that is, when they get fed, they need three or four days downtime to relax. In nature, they would hide, wouldn't come out for three or four days, sometimes even longer. Now, if you're handling that snake on a daily basis, it never reaches that point where it knows that, okay, I've, I've got three or four days clear that if I do get a meal, I can eat, I'll be fine. And the other side of that is, if you do happen to feed the snake, and it does eat, which most of them do, and then you handle it the next day, it is probably going to regurgitate that meal, particularly if it's a big meal. Smaller meals, they're fine. What I normally say to people, you can handle your snake for would say, up to an hour at a time daily until you feed it. Then when you feed it, let's say you feed it on the Monday. So you've handled it Saturday, Sunday, even Monday morning. You feed it on Monday evening, the snake eats. Don't touch it again until Thursday at all. Just check that it's fine. Don't touch it. And it's so tempting because that's why you've got the thing. You want to hold it. You want to interact with it. The snake doesn't want that. It'll shy away. And any, any stress, and it throws up its food. If it throws up its food, it's set back often worse than if it hadn't eaten in the first place. Because with the food, there goes all the energy ex it expended eating the food in the first place, and a whole lot of gut bacteria comes up as well. The good gut bacteria, the stuff that's trying to digest the food. So if it does regurgitate, which happens, don't feed it again for at least your normal feeding gap, if, if that makes sense. So if you feed it on a weekly basis, and you feed it on Monday, regurges on Wednesday, don't feed it that Monday, feed it the following Monday. Give it a bit of time to recover, a bit of time, it may even shed its skin in the interim, and they don't eat, the, they don't eat when they're gonna shed and their And try skin. not handle them too much during don't, that period yeah, of time. Don't handle it after that, just give it a bit of, <laughs> bit of time out. And so let's talk feeding. Feeding, how, how frequently would you advise, particularly, you know, obviously from early development to, to later on? Um, so the younger the snake is, the more frequently it will want to eat, the more frequently it will be able to eat as well, and you're feeding it small meals. Now, without getting too specific, there's a whole variety of different species, from corn snakes right through to Burmese pythons, boa constrictors, all different sizes, different requirements. Most common rule of thumb is once a week. Okay, that's, that's what we tell people. Once a week is quite fine. Also fits into our human sch uh, schedule quite easily, Sunday, Monday, whatever. As a keeper and a breeder myself, I normally try and feed the baby snakes every four days. I'm gonna say every four days. With my weekly schedule, it's every three, every four, every five days. It doesn't matter. What I normally suggest is if the snake is not out actively hunting, 
If it's a nocturnal snake, he'll be out hunting in the evening. If he hasn't got his head out from underneath his hide and walking around the cage, he don't even try him. Okay. Just leave him. If he's out hunting, he's ready to eat. So the baby snakes, once a week is fine. Adult snakes, once every two to three weeks. And the male snakes, how's this for another thing? The male snakes will go off food right the way through winter and right the way through mating season. So for some snakes, that's up to seven or eight months that the male snake not interested in food at all, at all. So that's not a sign of illness? No, it's normal. He's a male. And the males are generally, generally smaller than the females. Not always, but generally. And it's quite fine and healthy for them to be smaller. The females will eat sporadically through winter and ravenously just before breeding season. So how do you go about sexing a snake? Sexing snakes is a tricky thing. Um, there's no like pink booties, blue booties, or, or like <laughs> horns or something that sticks out of them. <laughs> Visibly sexing a baby snake is generally across most species impossible. You can't look at it and see. The difference is the males have their sex organs in their tails. The females have their, their sex organs in or everything up inside their body. So if you palpate or squeeze the male's tail, the hemipenis have got two penises, by the way will pop out if you squeeze gently. Okay, if you don't squeeze hard enough, nothing will come out or it's a female. <laughs> so it is really tricky. So you get this little baby snake and you can sometimes, I'm doing it all delicately here with my fingers because you want to see. Sometimes you turn it over and you can see clear as day. It's, the male's tail is thicker, it's got more of a bulge, it's clear as day. But most of the time you actually have to gently squeeze and these two little hemipenies will pop out. So that is the one, that is the, the safest way to do it. The other way is what we call to probe them which is a little bit more, a little more technical, where you take a stainless steel probe, and I think the measurement is 0 0.02 mils, so it is small. And you insert that going towards the tail into the cloaca, heading towards the tail, not upwards. I've described this before, and people mm, try and probe the, the wrong way. way. So what you're trying to do is to, sleeve that, or to push that through the sleeve of the male's hemipenis, one of them. And if it goes down past four scales, it's a male. Okay. Okay. If it doesn't, you've either done it wrong or it's a female. So being 100% certain is not, is not easy. So probably best left to, best left to professionals expert. or experts. I'll, I'll be honest, once, once you've seen it done a few times and you've tried a few times, I'm not saying like trial and error at the expense mm. of an animal, mm. it's not difficult to, to pop them, which is what it's called when the hemipenis pop out, pop sexing. You can teach a relatively nervous novice to do that relatively easily, popping. Okay. The probing. Yeah is best left to people that are well confident and well versed in it. How do you get there? I don't know. I don't know. It takes time and practice. Maybe practice on dead snakes. But it's, it's, it is possible, it's just not easy. When they're adults, the pop sexing is almost impossible with some species because they've now developed muscle strength in their tails. So you cannot pop sex most adult male snakes. Some, like black mambas for example, not that they're pet snakes. <laughs> Every single time I catch a black mamba, just for interest's sake, I sex every snake that I catch. But the easiest thing is you caught the thing, as you, pretty much as you turn over its tail, if it's a male, those two hemipenis pop out. I don't know why, but they do. And some snakes, you physically cannot get them to do that. So sexing snakes, is a, it's not a gray area, um, but it's not an easy thing to do. Professionals will do, but it's not easy. And now, a word from our amazing sponsors who make the Pause and Effect podcast possible. To make a promise implies trust. To make a pledge creates expectation, and to make a commitment initiates responsibility. For more than 25 years, we have made it our mission to take the ifs, buts, and maybes out of premium pet food. That's why our experts put the best science behind our food, so your pet's health is put first. That's why when you seek value, we strive to give you more, like protecting your pets with our free accident benefits. And when you need great tasting food, our fresh meat taste delivers. You see, what sets us apart is not one thing, it's all these things combined. Because we understand that when it comes to your pet's health, you don't want doubt and uncertainty, you want absolutes, the absolute best given your means, like premium veterinary quality food of real value that doesn't cost an arm and a paw. So rest assured, that any claim we make, we stand by. It's our commitment to your pets and our promise to you. In fact, we're so confident in what we stand for that we have made the ultimate promise to you. It's called the Ultra Pet Promise, 
a 100% money back guarantee, a no ifs, no buts and no maybes kind of promise. We call it our satisfaction guarantee. Let's get back to our conversation on the Pause and Effect podcast. So other than preference for, you know, particular colour or um, I, I know that my son wanted an albino because that was obviously the trend at the time or with some of his interest, what, what is your advice in terms of um, selecting a suitable snake for perhaps, a, let's say, a child? Because obviously you can make your own decisions as an adult. Mm. So it's... My opinion is venomous snakes don't have a place in captivity. That's my opinion, and I won't enter into an argument with that because I respect other people's opinions. I don't believe venomous snakes should be kept as pets, okay? Taking three or four steps down from there, the species should be easy to keep, okay? Some species are really beautiful, like green tree pythons and Amazon tree bows, emerald tree bows. They are stunning, beautiful snakes, and they're not venomous. So it fits into my non-venomous thing. They're lovely, and they're beautiful, but they are not easy to keep. So you see the snake, some of them are a bit more expensive than you could afford anyway as a novice, but you see the snake, it's really beautiful, how do you need to keep it? Then you find out, oh, it needs specific lighting and heating and humidity requirements, so it, it takes it into the realm of difficult. So the snake has to be, in my opinion, harmless, non-venomous, and easy to keep and not get to a size that is not maintainable. So currently, Burmese pythons, you cannot keep them without a permit. When I started keeping snakes. You could go to a pet shop and buy a Burmese python. Beautiful, lovely little snake, about as thick as your thumb, stunning colors. You get them in albinos and normal colors and they're beautiful. And what some pet shops won't tell you is that the snake has the potential of getting to four meters, as thick as a man's thigh. So it's, it's similar to someone going to a pet shop wanting a dog. They live in a complex and the guy sells them a Great Dane or a Puppy. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what this it's is. It's lovely. It's <laughs> awesome and it's great and it outgrows your requirements. Also, they don't live for two years like a hamster. These big pythons have a lifespan of up to 30 years, it's reasonably, comfortably 18 years. So where are you going to be in 18 years? And we, we do see that happen every now and again, the same with dogs and cats, that they, they outlive your, your ability to keep them. And I do lay some blame there, but it, it's life. So back to that. Non-venomous, relatively easy to keep, not going to get too big. Um, Food is available readily from wherever you are. Most pet shops will sell frozen rats and mice. So you need to make sure the snake, the species you're buying, is a rat or a mouse feeder. Some things eat specifically frogs or eggs or lizards, and you need to make sure you can get those. Egg eaters always sound like a great idea mm. until you realize you can't get availability eggs. Availability is an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So food availability and ease of keeping and size. Then also, it's becoming more of an issue these days body corporate issues. Do you have to hide the thing from your body corporate, which a lot of people do? So you need to check your, your, your own, we, we're sitting here in KZN, so we're relatively easy, but I'm sure other provinces have different, different things. You need to check your own bylaws. Some bylaws require you to have permits to keep the snakes. Um, some body corporates won't allow it at all. Your landlord, this is where I see problems as well. Hi, I've moved house, I need to get rid of all my snakes. Should have thought about that first. So a lot goes into choosing a species. Um, color is vital. You also have to like the thing. Don't just get the snake because your mate's got one and you now want to be cool. You actually have to like the thing to start with and be comfortable with it. Now, often when, when I'm, and I have sold snakes for years, if you hand that snake to that kid and he is terrified or his mom is terrified, you're making a mistake. Oh, another thing as well, parents. <laughs> okay, you're a lovely parent. You've allowed your son to get the snake, it's great. <laughs> Bear in mind, a percentage of caring for that snake is going to fall on the parents for a while. As the kids get older, they may or may not keep the snake. I mean, most, most, of, most of the starters are novices, like your son, like I was. And the interest eventually becomes their own. But for a while, same as a hamster, same as a rabbit, you get the thing because the kid wants it, the kid's not going to do anything. They're not going to clean the cage. You're going to have to remind them to change the water bowl. So the whole lot goes into choosing to get a snake. Absolutely. Or a pet. And so your suggestion, particularly for my son and my circumstances, was to start with a corn snake. Um, lots of options in terms of color variations and they don't get too big and um, a great suggestion, thank you very much. But one of the problems that we had very early on is, so probably my responsibility, you've got to take that on as a parent, is we started with a small snake, so they're tiny, they've just been born. And obviously the requirement is to keep them confined, um, which is quite difficult when I they're small. 
<laughs> so I don't, I don't really want to make the admission as to how many snakes are um, probably Got living out. in my house. Um, and of course, every time, totally devastated that the snake has escaped because he hasn't closed the, the cage properly. Um, we, we eventually started in the small, in fact, you've got um, some snakes here to demonstrate the small containers and inside the big cage. And then Wait till it when he, she was um, at a size that <laughs> it was a bit safer and we had got used to handling. Um, but w other than obviously them escaping, what are the common things you come across in terms of issues with snake ownership? Escaping does happen. Um, either they don't close the cage properly or friends come around sitting on the couch with a snake and you forget and you're watching TV and yeah. suddenly the snake's gone, that happens. No, we've, we've had that. You know, it happens mm. a lot more often than, than people would like to think. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you can understand it. And also you think, well, where, where's it going to go? But it goes inside the couch. It goes behind. So escapes happen. Um, thermostat failures or heating pad failures, they happen. Um, the other thing, your, your, your um, lady that cleans your house, your domestic worker, may or may not accept that there's a snake in the kid's bedroom. So that's another thing you've got to look at. Suddenly the kid's bedroom is not getting cleaned or the cage gets bumped or knocked and you can't then blame someone else. Um, what else do we have main problems? Availability of food. So I thought that's where you were going to touch on as well. Is, so you've bought this little tiny baby corn snake and they are tiny. They're literally the size of a pencil. <laughs> Which is actually easier because I, I was nervous. And so when you're starting with mentally a worm, it's much easier to then become familiar as they grow that you get more and more familiar so the, with them. The, the funny thing, so I'm jumping around here, but when, when I do talk for schools and things, the small ones are the scary ones. Oh, really? Kids don't want to touch the little oh. guys because they, they move quickly. There's a large percentage of snake in a very small area, whereas when you've got a bigger snake, it's, it's tangible. So you hand okay. them a ball python or a whatever, and they, they, it's, it's bigger. But okay. the, what it was actually going to go to, so you've got this tiny little pencil sized snake that needs tiny little baby mice called pinkies when you go and ask for them from a pet shop. Um, and that's not always easy to get. It's not always easy as a mom to get your head around it either, where you've got frozen mice in your freezer at home and amongst your ice cream and your peas. Um, so that is an issue. And then you go to the pet shop and they look at you blandly and say, no, we don't have pinkies today. So what snake needs to eat today? What do we do? Wait. So food availability is often a problem with the little guys. So there's no option, and sorry, I'm asking, I've never been in that position, but there's no option to cut up a bigger one. It does happen. Um, what, can you do anything else? Can you offer any other meat or is some, there? Particularly the rat snakes, which corn snakes are a, 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 of the family of rat snakes, will take um, chicken fillet voluntarily. They often just grab it like it's made for them. Some will take pet shop guppies. Um, some will take pieces of hake, funny enough, like hake that we, you and I would eat. But generally, no. So it's mice, house geckos are sometimes an option as well. People can't get food for their snakes. So here in Durban, we're spoiled. Geckos are a bit nervous, but they, you can feed them house geckos. So no, generally, there's no, there's no real other way around it. Um, other problems, I can't really think, I probably can just now, but I can't think of other issues that we have. Escapes are an issue, um, and they don't then want to be found. And I know of instances where it's taken six or seven months to find the snake in the sock drawer in the same bedroom where it escaped. A mate of mine moved house and found the snake in his new house after moving. Oh, wow. So it had been in something. Something, yeah. Uh, months later. So escapes are a problem. On tiled surfaces, it's relatively easy. You sprinkle talcum powder around the perimeters and you see where it moves through the powder. But on carpeted surfaces, it's, it's tricky. And do they go up or do they go down? Yes. Up. Down. Down. Sideways, left, Every right, <laughs> everywhere. They, they will get in So you can't predict anywhere. where they've gone no. and the direction they've gone, I guess. Sometimes they don't go particularly far. Like if the cage is on top of your, your chest of drawers, it's probably in your chest of drawers, okay. in your socks, in your underpants, in something. somewhere. Yeah. Mm. And they, they go into the smallest of places. They really do. And in terms of just finally, just to wrap up our conversation on husbandry, um, after handling snakes, obviously you're feeding them raw meat. And are there any things that, as parents or owners of snake, you have to be aware of in terms of hygiene for yourself? Do they carry salmonella, E. coli, those sorts of? Yeah. So, personally, me, I have a very open relationship with hygiene. I'll eat food straight off the floor myself. So, <laughs> I'm probably not the best guy to ask about hygiene. But that's it. Common sense. If you've just handled your snake and the snake's food, wash your hands. I don't personally know of anybody who's had salmonella provably from handling their reptiles, but it's certainly possible. I mean, we're feeding animals to animals, so it's well possible. Um, e. coli, any other type of bacteria, there's feces involved. Your dead food animal has got 
bacteria on it. So yes, wash your hands after feeding the snake. The other thing that, that um, is also interesting to note and happens quite often, when people have pet snakes and breed their own food for their pet snakes, so they've, you know, some people do, they breed their own rats and mice, and it's, 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 a, it's a common thing. In fact, it's a sensible thing sometimes. So they've gone into their rat room and they've cleaned and fed all their rats. And they come out now smelling of <gasps> snake food. And they then go to show their mates or pick up a snake. That snake has no concept that you are not now food. And accidents and bad accidents happen with people that have just yeah, bitten and badly. And it's a feeding bite then as well. Now you must bear in mind, most defensive bites are a simple bite and let go from a venomous or a harmless species. When it's a feeding bite, that feeding bite is bite and hang on and make sure that animal doesn't get away. So the, the accidental bites that happen as a result of that person's fingers smelling a bit like rat or mouse or cat or dog or rabbit or chicken, so bear in mind as well, your own pets may be potential food animals for your snakes. Maybe. So yeah, before you handle your snakes, wash your hands. You also don't want to spread viruses, bacteria, anything else from someone else's collection to your own collection. So just, just be sensible. Just one thing I just want to touch on quickly as well with regards to, to husbandry, and it's a little bit higher than, than kids need to know, is treatment of parasites and things in snakes, in captivity. There are parasites. You know, people often think, but it's, it's a hose pipe. It's a flipping hose pipe. How can it have? It's not. It's a live animal with organs and intestines and heart and lungs, same as everything else. So there are parasites. There are infections they can get. There are burns, burns that they can get. Don't sit too long. I'm guilty of this as well because I think I know everything. So by the time I've taken my snake to the vet, it's too late for the vet to save the snake because I think I've done everything right. As soon as you're not sure, get veterinary advice at least. Maybe you don't necessarily have to take your snake to the vet, not all vets will see snakes, but get advice. The most common parasites that we get with snakes are a thing called mites. They only occur in captive collections. I've never, I mean, I've been doing call-outs for close on 700 years and I've never seen mites on a wild snake. Ticks, yes, but never mites. People say, where do they come from? I honestly personally think they come straight from hell. I don't know how they get here. <laughs> But they're Should suddenly. It's good through the. Could be. Uh, we, we can talk feeding, about this. Like so it's from speculate. somewhere. It's normally from. It, it's, it's contact. So it's from someone else who had it, whether it's the pet shop where you bought your, your feed or your bedding, maybe in the bedding, maybe from the pet shop, maybe from the food supply store. And I'm not laying blame mm -hmm. anywhere. I'm just saying it, it, it happens. happens. Yeah. Um, so you, you come home from somewhere and a mite may be on your shirt. And you walk into your room and you drop that mite. And suddenly on Wednesday, you have mites like you cannot believe. Relatively easy to treat, but I don't personally think you ever really get rid of them in a collection once you've had them. So quarantining your animals is vitally important, whether you're guarding against mites or any other infection. If you bring a new snake into, let's call it a collection, maybe you've got two snakes, maybe you've got 200 snakes, you're bringing a new animal into your environment. Quarantine it for a couple of days. Just check that there's nothing wrong with it, it's all fine. If you do happen to get mites into your collection, there are certain sprays that work incredibly well, and then there's the old school thing, Vipona, which is a cupboard strip that kills fish moths and things, that works amazingly well. But in my opinion, once you have mites in your setup, you will never really be truly rid of them. They seem so to have manage an, it longer term. Yeah, you need to manage it, and if there's an infestation that breaks out, you treat it much like you would ticks and fleas on a dog. So people say, yeah, oh, this is what I use to treat ticks and fleas. If it was effective, you wouldn't have to do it twice. No, it doesn't work like that. Ticks and fleas and mites, they just, they're around. So my final question to you before we take a break is, do people want to identify their snake? Can you microchip a snake? Yeah. Like, can you? Very differently. The biggest species and why do people want to? So there's a, whole, yeah, there's a whole bundle of stuff that goes into that. The smaller species you can't microchip because a microchip's the size. size of a grain of rice. So you can't do it in a baby corn snake. It's, it's too big. But what some of the municipalities and provinces want legally is for you to microchip your snakes. So there's traceability. If your snake, like you said, you've got one or two that ran away. If your, which yours aren't, invasive species is found living somewhere, they can improve ownership and blame you. Okay. Also, some of these things are worth an absolute fortune. Some of these ball python species, I bet you brought one here. I'm going to show you a ball python. Oh, please. Some of these, this is not a, not a particularly expensive one. But some of these oh, ball wow. python species or specimens, color varieties, can sell for in excess of 100,000 rand, okay? And this is unidentifiable, it's a, it's a snake. So if you microchip this, and you believe you found it in someone else's collection, you scan it for a microchip, you can prove it. So yeah, microchipping, identifying your snake, it helps 
in the event of theft, it helps in the event of escaping. Um, it's, it's a, it's a two-way thing, so it, it, does, it does add value to the snake. Also, if you've got a large collection of snakes, which some of the ball python breeders do, I mean, some guys have got hundreds of them, and you need to keep feeding records. You can scan it, so snake number 002 has eaten this, snake number 005 has done this, you've mated snake 08 with 05, you've produced this. That's so the excellent. microchip helps with ID, with ID of, of your snake. Um, I think that covers that. Yeah, that's oh. great. That's oh, really... So there's this little guy, this little five-month-old normal ball python. Beautiful. And uh, growing nicely. These guys get to around about just over 1.2 meters long, weighing up to about two kilos, and currently the most popular pet species of snake in the world. The reason for that is they don't get particularly big. They eat smallish meals like rats and mice, and they never, ever bite. They're like the Labradors of the snake world. Oh, nice. they, just, they have no intention of biting. And the reason they're so super popular is they occur in an untold variety of colors. So they're beautiful. Yeah, really, really pretty snakes. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Cool. Thanks so much, Byron. We have an exciting announcement to make. We are looking for guest speakers who are passionate about the pet industry and sponsors to support future episodes. Are you an expert in pet training, nutrition, or behavior? Maybe you're a veterinarian with insights to share, a pet store owner with unique experiences, or a pet product inventor. We want to hear from you. The Pause and Effect podcast is a platform for industry professionals like you to showcase your knowledge, experiences, and stories. As a guest speaker on our podcast, you'll have the opportunity to share valuable information, engage with our audience, and have your voice heard in the pet community. Whether you want to discuss training techniques, emerging pet care trends, or the importance of mental stimulation for pets, we want to feature you and your expertise. So, if you're passionate about pets and have something to say, we invite you to join us on an upcoming episode of the Pause and Effect podcast. But wait, that's not all. The Pause and Effect podcast is also seeking sponsors to support our mission of educating and entertaining pet lovers worldwide. By becoming a sponsor, you'll gain exposure to our engaged audience and have your brand associated with the love and care that we have for our four-legged friends. If you own a pet-related business, offer pet products or services, or simply want to align your brand with our pet-loving community, we'd love to partner with you. As a sponsor, your brand will be featured prominently in our episodes and our social media channels. It is a great opportunity to showcase your offerings to a dedicated audience of pet enthusiasts. So whether you're an expert in the pet industry looking to share your knowledge or a business seeking to reach a pet-loving audience, we want to hear from you. To apply as a guest or to inquire about becoming a sponsor of the Pause and Effect podcast, please contact me at drkara at pauseandeffect.co.za. Get in touch and let's discuss the various opportunities. Thank you for joining us today. We can't wait to welcome our future guest speakers and sponsors to the Pause and Effect podcast. Remember, every episode is an opportunity to celebrate our four-legged friends.